You are listening to a sermon by Pastor Christopher Sally of New Life Christian Fellowship Church. Psalms 22, a picture of that suffering and crucified shepherd. The good shepherd that lays down his life for the sheep. Psalms 23, that picture of the serving and caring shepherd. The uh, great shepherd that's seen in Hebrews 13 and 10. And in Psalms 24, the picture of that sovereign and conquering shepherd, the chief shepherd that shall return one day, past, present, future, all pictured here. And we focus our attention on Psalms 23, and we focus our attention on verse 6. Surely, surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. What is the psalmist saying to us when he says, surely goodness mm, (laughs) and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life? I believe it is a summary statement about the care of the shepherd. It's a summary statement. He's saying that from what I've seen and what I've observed and what I've experienced with the shepherd, I can firmly say, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me. And I believe that the picture that you need to see is of goodness and mercy coming to you and goodness and mercy going through you so that it will follow you. I don't, I don't know if you heard me. I, I want you to know that the picture you get or the picture I get in my mind or what, I'm, what I hope that you see is that the goodness and mercy is coming to you. It's going through you and it should follow you and such that there is a statement that he's making that wherever I go, there should be goodness and mercy left there as a, a sign that I was there. Amen. That, that I should be in a place where once I leave a place and once I'm in an environment, when you, when you look up, what, what should happen is because I have received goodness and mercy, that's, that's what should be left as a marker everywhere that I go. It's really a lot like King Joffrey Joffre in coming to America. Everywhere that he went, he walked on rose petals. Amen. And so when Prince Akeem came back to his Brooklyn apartment and he got out of that cab, he saw that there were flowers on the ground. Amen. And so he knew immediately, oh, surely goodness and mercy. No, surely my father has been in this place because I know the markers of my father being in a place. I know what it looks like when I see rose petals. That means pops is around because I know the rose bearers, they're, they're not with me, but I know they're with him. That should be the same marker that wherever you go, people should look up and say, oh, no, no, no. Ashley's been here because I see the rose petals. I see, I see the goodness and mercy that has followed her. Oh, no, no, no. Melanie's been here because she's been with the shepherd and, the, and that, that goodness and mercy has come to her. That goodness and mercy is coming through her and it is following her because she's in line with the shepherd. And no matter what comes my way, two things I know my shepherd will not leave me without is goodness and mercy. When you look back over your life and you think things over, I can surely say that I've been blessed I've got a testimony. Surely I can say, I can truly say, I can surely say goodness and mercy has followed me because I've been walking with the shepherd. So you can say that even when friends 
turn their backs on you, even, even when you've had some struggles on your job, even when you haven't been available to, uh, to, uh, to be able to participate in an intimate relationship that you might be seeking, even when your children are driving you up the wall and acting a fool like they don't have no home training. You can still say, he didn't leave me without goodness and mercy. I remember I was having a particularly tough time at the job that I had many years ago at, at, at Greenfield Partners. We had, Kim and I had moved to Connecticut to take, to take this job. And it was just, there were some difficulties I was having with my partner, the founding partner. And I was discouraged. And I, 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 was, I, I was wondering, why, why did I do what I did? Why did I move my family to Connecticut? This doesn't seem to be working out. And the Lord told me in a particularly tough time I was having to go to the piano. And I played over and over and over again. He hath done marvelous. He has done marvelous things praise the lord he has done marvelous things he's done marvelous things praise the lord he's done marvelous He's done marvelous, praise the Lord. He's done marvelous, oh, so marvelous, praise the Lord. One more time, say, he has done marvelous things, he's done Marvelous these praise the Lord. And as I played that over and over, as I began to cry and cry and cry, the Lord let me know that I was not by myself, that he had not left me, that it was going to be okay, even if it wasn't going to be all right. Mm. <laughs> Surely goodness and mercy. He's still done marvelous things. It's still good. Because the goodness of God in your life is not based upon what he does for you. It's based upon your access to him. God is good because when he walks with you and you walk with him, he gives you access to himself. And if he gives you access to himself and he is good, then you will always have goodness with you. You can always declare God is good. Amen. It's, and it's not a goodness, again, that's based upon actions and activities. We like to say God is good when something happens good for us. But he's good regardless of whether he moves in your life the way you expected him to. His goodness is based not on actions or activities. His goodness is based on access. And he's implicitly good. And your God is immutably good. Meaning he's never been more good than he is right now. And he's not going to get any more good tomorrow than he is today. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is implicitly good. He's immutably good. And beloved, he is immeasurably good. I, know, I don't know if you know that or not but he is immeasurably good oh taste and see the psalmist says in psalms 34 that the lord is good blessed is the man that trusteth in him why boastest thyself O mighty man the goodness of god endureth continually and when moses asked to see god's glory he says i can't show you my glory because I'll make your head pop off. But I'm going to hide you in the cleft and I'm going to allow my goodness 
to pass. And he said, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. He's implicitly good. He's immutably good. Beloved, he's immeasurably good. So what you and I have to do, I just want to remind you is you need to recognize the goodness of God. If you don't recognize the goodness of God, it, it affects your attitude and your attitude will affect your outlook and it'll affect how you walk and how you talk, how you think it'll affect. If you don't understand it, you should be able to make the statement, surely goodness and mercy. If you if you don't see the goodness of God, you better recognize the implicit goodness of God, the immutable goodness of God, the immeasurable goodness of God. You got to you got to recognize it. But not, not only do you need to recognize it, beloved, you got to be in a place where you receive the goodness of God. Amen. And the best place to receive the goodness of God and see it in operation in your life is if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. It's because of the goodness of God. Romans 2 and 4 said it's from God's goodness that leadeth thee to repentance. You better receive the goodness of God in your life. Otherwise, you will never be in a place where you have the proper walk. You'll never be in a place where you'll follow the shepherd like you should because you won't recognize the goodness of God. But you got to receive the goodness of God. And then once you receive it, baby, you better rest in the goodness of God. You better rest in it. I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may uh, uh, that what that, that uh, accept what is that good and acceptable and perfect the will of God rest beloved in the goodness of God what that scripture is saying is the goodness the good the acceptable the perfect that's God's will are you gonna rest in what God says do you trust him that he knows better than you or are you constantly giving God little notes and asking him to make slight adjustments. <laughs> Brother and Kevin and I were talking last Sunday and we both could agree that if we could just be sovereign for five minutes, we could fix everything that God's not doing. Just give me five minutes. Just give me five minutes at the wheel. And we, we had a list of stuff that we had that said, yeah, we'll fix that. And then we'll give it back to you. Then you do it. Then you do it. But we just, it's this, it's, and everybody has that list. Everybody has those few things that say, yeah, you're good, and we, we understand you and everything. But give me five good minutes with my list, and then I turn it back over to you. And, then, but, but, and everything on your list will be all about you. No question about it. No question about it. But do we really trust him to be who he is, which is implicitly, immutably, and immeasurably good? You better rest in the goodness of God. And you got to rejoice in the goodness of God celebrate the goodness of God that's what the psalmist David is doing he says surely goodness and mercy shall follow me I'm gonna I'm gonna rejoice in the goodness of God and last but not least because I told you it's coming to you it should be going through you and it should follow you that means you also need to reflect the goodness of God there should not be a place that you go where we don't see the goodness of God in operation. Amen. The goodness of God should what? It should follow you everywhere that you, everywhere that you go. Everywhere that you go. Amen. That's what Ephesians 2 8 through 10 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast, but we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him, in them. And so again, you don't have to do anything for salvation, but what those verses remind us is you have to do something with it. We were created to do good works. And again, we're able to do good because we're with the shepherd. We're able to do good because he is the one who says, I know what good is. You couldn't, like I said, you couldn't find good with a flashlight. 
You can't find it. You don't know what it is, but I can decide good and I can even discuss good and I can do good, but I can also demand good from you. And you can you can reflect the goodness of God because you understand that you can reflect the character of God in everything that you do. Amen. That's the only way that we do good, because on our own, there's none that doeth good. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. We fall short every single time. That's what sin is But he's given us a new nature He's given us his nature And he says because I've given you my nature I'm going to demand from you What I have provided to you I have given you my divine nature Through the Holy Spirit And my expectation is You'll do good because you've seen good You've experienced good And I want that goodness to flow through you I want to look up and see rose petals Everywhere you go so folk know and understand, the people of God have been in this place. The thing I told you about sheep is that they're very destructive. And they just, the six inches in front of their face, that that's all they're concerned about. And I also told you they fertilize as they go. And if you don't move sheep around and you leave them to their own devices, they will literally pollute wherever they are. They'll, they'll eat everything down to the, all the way down to the nubs, if you will, and they'll destroy that. But what I can also tell you is, properly led by a good shepherd Sheep become very productive and they can actually increase the harvest and they can increase the vitality, excuse me, of the lamb. But a shepherd has to keep them on the move. The shepherd has to provide for them. But if they follow him, they will eat all of those the weeds and crabgrass kind of things and they'll, they'll, they'll leave the land better than how they found it. They will go from the low places and then they will... If you keep them on the move, they'll be able to fertilize. Come on, somebody, in the high places where it's, it's tougher to get that fertilization. And so if we follow the shepherd and we allow the shepherd to, to lead us where we need to go, the land and the place and the environment can be left better than where we found it. Amen. It doesn't have to be destructive. Sheep can be very productive, not destructive, if they follow a good shepherd. And David is saying, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Why? Because I'm going to follow the shepherd. I'm going to be obedient to what he reveals. I'm not going to be stagnant and I'm going to submit. This is a tough thing for us to understand and do. But if we follow the example of the sheep, if the sheep are led, they become very productive animals. Don't you don't I won't don't we want to be productive? The only way that we can is if we follow the shepherd. And then David says this, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now, I, I will tell you that at first glance, you may only see that scripture one way or see that affirmation one way. But I tell you that there's a threefold affirmation that David is making. It's threefold, and it gets better and better. The first affirmation that David is making when he says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, it's an affirmation of permanence. It's an affirmation of permanence. He is saying, I will never be removed from this sheepfold. His care is forever, amen? And that's an exciting thing when you know that Jesus says in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them what? Eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father which has given them to me is greater than all and no man 
can pluck them out of my father's hand. So what he's saying is, David says, I'm unpluckable. Come on, somebody. You can't pluck me out of my father's hand. I'm going to follow, and I am in this sheepfold forever. There is permanence that's there. The permanence that comes when in Ephesians 1 it says, in whom you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom after ye believed ye were what? Sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. God said, I am so sure that you, you, they can't pluck you out of my hand that I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit now as an earnest deposit until you get the purchased possession. Until you're with me, I'm going to give you my spirit to lead and to guide and to cheer and to comfort and to counsel. I'm going to give you all of that right now. And David is saying, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But you say, nah, that's not shoutable, Pastor. That's, that's, and I would disagree with you. That's the first part of the shout, though. It's an affirmation of permanence. The second thing it is, it's, it's, a, it's an affirmation, beloved, of pleasure. David said, oh, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When he says one thing, I have desired of the Lord. <laughs> that will I seek ever. That will I seek after. That I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. David said, there's, there's one thing that I'm focused on, amen, and that is dwelling in the house of the Lord forever. It's an affirmation of pleasure. It, it, it's, 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 it's showing us that there is a desire that I have to, to, to be where he is. Amen. That's why Psalms 84 says, how lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young, a place near your altar. O Lord Almighty, my, my King and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. David says, I want to be where I know the praise party is and that's in your presence. Affirmation of permanence, affirmation of pleasure. One more. It's last for a reason. It's an affirmation of priority. David said, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And when I say it's an affirmation of priority, David is saying that I am committing myself to dwelling because David knows, like you know, as you're reminded from Scripture in Psalms 24 and verse 3, it says this, who shall ascend? into the hill of the Lord. I wish I had a church this morning. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord or who shall stand in the holy place? Come on, he that hath clean hands and a pure heart who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity nor sworn deceitfully. He's asking the question, who, who's able to stand in your, in, in your presence? Who's able to dwell in your holy hill? Who can get down with you like that? And the answer comes back, only he that has clean hands and a clean heart. So when I say it's an affirmation of priority, David is saying, I understand that if I'm going to be in your presence, I better have clean hands and a clean heart. That means I got to clean my life up. That means I got to follow you and I have to trust you and I have to obey you. What you reveal, I need to do. I don't need to, I, I just need to simply receive what you reveal. I don't need to reject it and rethink it and replace it. I just need to receive what you have for me. I have to see your truth. I have to follow you. I have to follow you with my whole heart. It's an affirmation of priority. I know what it takes to stay in your what? Presence. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in the holy hill? That's Psalms 15 now. Another Psalm of David. David is like, there's some requirements of the man and woman of God 
There's some things that the man and the woman of God have to be about the business of doing if they're going to dwell. And so you can't just listen to what I'm saying. When you make an affirmation that says, I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, you're committing yourself to the requirements. It's not just the privileges, beloved. It's the responsibilities. That's a problem that we have in our society in general today. We're always focused on the privileges, but rarely are we focused on the responsibilities. Even when we think of church, we always think, unfortunately, about what we can get instead of what we can give. We're always looking at things through the lens of consumption. What's best for how I want to consume the things that I see around me? And it's not just about the privileges of being with the pastor, being with the shepherd. It's about the responsibilities. And David said, I know this. He, that, he said, who can do it? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor taketh up a reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is contemned. But he honoreth them that fear the Lord. He that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He that putteth out his money uh, without taking interest, nor, nor taketh any reward against the innocent. He that doeth these things shall never be moved. David said, I, I understand that there's some things that, that, that have to happen. I understand what a godly man or a godly woman does. That, that, that person guides their walk with righteousness and they, they guard their wisdom with truthfulness and they grow their witness with kindness and they govern their way with cleanliness and they grant their word with firmness and they gather their wealth with fairness. Therefore, they can give their worship with faithfulness. Now, I know you didn't catch all that, so go back and listen to it later. But those are the folks that dwell. And David said, I want to be a dweller. I'm not going to just be a taker. I'm going to be a dweller. I know that it's an affirmation of, of, of pleasure. I know it's an affirmation of permanence. But I also understand it is an affirmation of priority. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He's the one that satisfies me. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He's the one that settles me. He leads me beside the still waters. He's the one that supplies me. He restores my soul. He's the one that saves me. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's the one that sanctifies me. Yea, uh, thou anointest my head with, 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 uh, 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 with, with oil, that I, you're the one that safeguards me. Thy rod and thy, no, thou, thou preparest the table for me, thou sight in the presence of my enemies, thou safeguardest me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, you're the one that stabilizes me. Thou preparest the table, you're the one that sacrifices for me. You anoint my head with oil, you're the one that secures me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. You're the one that supports me. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You're the one that seals me. Amen. Do you see the comprehensive care of the, of the shepherd? You satisfy me, you settle me, you supply me, you save me, you sanctify me, you safeguard me, you stabilize me, you sacrifice for me, you secure me, you support me, and you seal me. Why? Because you are Jehovah Jireh, my provider, I shall not want. You're Jehovah Shalom, my peace. You maketh me to lie down. You're, you're Jehovah Rapha, my healer, because you restoreth my soul. You're Jehovah Tishkanu, my righteousness, because you lead me in the path of righteousness. You're Jehovah Mkadesh, my sanctifier, because you do it for your name's sake. You're Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there, because they that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. You are Jehovah Nisi, my batter, because your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's why I can call you Jehovah Rohi, the Lord, my shepherd. I shall not want. 
Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell. It's an invitation to you, anyone listening, that if you are in a sheepfold where you cannot say the things that we're saying right now about your shepherd, you could be in a sheepfold where you haven't even seen your shepherd because the scripture says that when the wolf comes, the hireling runs off and leaves the sheep. You may not even seen your shepherd. Nobody's organizing and providing for you. And all you're doing is eating and pooping all in the same space. And your world is completely torn up. There is a shepherd that if you follow, he will satisfy you. He'll settle you. He'll sanctify you. He'll, he'll, he'll supply you. He'll support you. He'll seal you. All of that is available. But you have to make a commitment to him and say, I want to be a part of the kingdom of God. As I signaled to you last week around what we desire as a people of God in every situation, we're looking for what is right. But we're not going to settle for the right thing if it's not the right thing for the right reason. And we're not going to settle for the right thing for the right reason if it doesn't flow from the right relationship. We want it all because that's what God wants. The right thing done for the right reason based upon the right relationship. Otherwise, you are not building. You're only building for time and not eternity. But God loves us with an eternal love. His eternal perspective means you have to be in the right relationship with the king. And then we can be kingdom people that are operating out of kingdom values. But if you have no relationship with the king, you're not in his sheepfold and you're not getting this kind of care. This is the care God wants to provide to all of us. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for sin. And that's why he's given us the message that we see in 2 Corinthians 5, where we are ambassadors making his appeal on his behalf. Be ye reconciled to God. That's more important than anything we can do. Whatever focus or purpose you have in your life, don't forget that God's purpose for all of his kingdom people is to see his kingdom come to see his kingdom people living out their lives with kingdom values because they have a relationship with the king and they know that the best thing we can do for our dying and sick world that is pooped all over itself and eating everything and consumed everything and drinking out of muddy puddles and emaciated and they've been brutalized by the shepherd of this life, the enemy, that the best thing we can do is offer Christ to them and get them to switch sheepfolds, not just for time, but for eternity. <laughs>